45. So Carly, quick introduction. Um, thank you for being here remotely. I'm so glad it worked out. Um, she's a senior water resource manager for the Bureau of Reclamation. She was recently selected to lead the development of the updated operating rules for Lakes Powell and Mead. She's currently stationed at the University of Colorado Center for Advanced Decision Support for Water and Environmental Systems alongside Reclamation's upper and lower Colorado River Basin regions research, planning and modeling teams. And she can tell us more about her role in the upcoming guideline management negotiations. Welcome, Carly. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And just, just checking that you can hear me okay? Yes, you can, sounds good. Okay, great. Well, th thank you, Alice, and, and to you and Sean for putting on and organizing the conference and giving me the opportunity to still participate virtually. Much appreciated, um, Terry. Uh, thank you for the perfect um, foundation background on where we've been, how we got here. Um, and thank you for your leadership through all of that. It's, it's hard to believe it's almost been a year since you've retired. Um, I think we've, we've managed to keep the basin going uh, since that time, but um, I think it's clear that your leadership is missed as well. Uh, I also wanted, before I start, to, to recognize um, Dr. Kenny and I uh, give my best wishes for his retirement. Um, Doug was uh, my advisor, one of my advisors, when I was in graduate school about 15 years ago. And it was about at that time he invited me to this conference and gave me the highly spot at um, to speak during the happy hour session. I was in that room giving a presentation on my screening model I developed for my master's project um, while happy hour was going on in the courtyard. So, um, you know, maybe there were four or five people that came in. Plenty, plenty audience that I needed at that level. Um, but so thanks, Doug, for that opportunity that break in opportunity and, and for your uh, guidance and advice through the years. So with that, I'll, I'll start here um, by recognizing the obvious that, that these are challenging times. And as our deputy commissioner um, Tutin noted at the time we released our August 24 month study that declared the first ever shortage in the lower basin and under our 1944 treaty with Mexico, the that we planned four years ago and hoped we would never see is here. And if the times are not challenging enough, enter the fact that we have just five more annual operating plans under the current operating guidelines for Powell and Mead. So we're in a situation where we're working to address the current challenges brought on by drought and dry hydrology with an uncertain future, future operating policies. Um, the interim guidelines, minute 323 and the DCPs give us a solid foundation for our operation through 2026. And soon as we start work together to develop those policies, we very well may find ourselves doing so simultaneously while addressing the additional challenges brought on by dr drought and dry hydrology. It's just, it's a massive challenge and difficult to wrap your mind around. Um, it's a massive task to develop those post-2026 operations, even in good times. These are not good times, hydrologically speaking. And so how should we move forward in a way that sets us up for success? Uh, to, to help answer that, I think it's worth revisiting the extensive input from a broad set of stakeholders that we received uh, during our view the interim guidelines or our 7D process. These helped shape our understanding regarding the and understanding and findings regarding the effectiveness of the guidelines. Comments that were outside of the retrospective scope of the review, but express important perspectives on ways that our approaches and previous processes can be improved that can help guide how we move forward in the post-2026 process. And to summarize, they they've general th themes, stakeholder engagement. Uh, they emphasize the 
importance of expanded, robust, and meaningful stakeholder engagement and operating operational decision making. Modeling approaches, uh, emphasizing the importance of utilizing best available science and tools to inform decision making, and to also take a broad approach and consider multiple future scenarios and outcomes. And lastly, resource analysis, uh, emphasizing the importance of a thorough analysis to, um, of the impact to resources and, and current operations and involvement of stakeholders in that analysis. So taken together, these comments express a core set of principles and approaches, a uh, desire for transparency, inclusivity, and the incorporation of best available science and methods to guide our post-2026 operations. And while the 7D review is the most recent documentation of these comments and sentiments, they are not new. As we have designed past processes, themes, thoroughness, inclusivity, collaboration, science-based, these have always been the guiding themes. And that's not to say there isn't room for improvement. These concepts have evolved over the years with increased public awareness, technology and scientific advancements, heightened partner and stakeholder interest, and a desire for meaningful input. And while there are some aspects worth carrying forward from past processes, the design of the post-2026 process needs to be updated, modernized, and expanded in a thoughtful way to reflect the current times. So back on those three themes, how have they evolved and where do we sit today with respect to stakeholder involvement? Uh, we absolutely have seen expanded inclusivity and partnerships, and those have been essential. I think as Terry highlighted to the more recent operational decisions in the basin, three with Mexico, the drought contingency plans, there has been continued emphasis put on greater tribal involvement and participation and engaging tribes in a more meaningful way. Consistent and proactive communication is important here, and we're working to develop approaches that are in that spirit. Uh, there's been an increased role by the NGOs. Our lead consistently called for greater inclusivity, and the Basin States have recognized this as well. And we have to acknowledge the significant accomplishments we've made with Mexico and want to continue to strengthen that partnership. And technical side, modeling and analysis, there's been many advancements made in our suite of decision support, not only in the model themselves, but the inputs that drive the models and the approaches taken um, to frame and analyze those results. And I, I wanna build on one comment that Terry made with respect to capacity and how important that is, the ability for our stakeholders and those approaches and results, uh, this really empowers them with the ability to meaningfully participate in the discussions. Um, and we're working to help enhance and build that capacity, um, particularly with the tribes. And uh, I think a very related theme is regarding transparency as it relates to modeling. And this has been central to the core of our modeling work really since the beginning. As Terry described, we really started off with a Fortran model that only two people, um, two or three people could understand and run. And we've come a long way since then. And what we see today is more and more stakeholder partners and consultants doing their own analyses, actively running the model, but also scrutinizing the model and its layout and assumptions. And this is a good thing. Um, we're not threatened by this in any way. And uh, it, this leads to improvements and a more educated stakeholder base. So we, we really do consider this to be a success um, uh, working towards transparency. And then lastly, on the analysis side, I just want to highlight, as folks probably have been hearing from uh, presentations that we've been giving recently, um, where we've been investing in a lot of research and science to give us new approaches um, to the post-2026 process, uh, field of deep uncertainty, where we can kind of think about 
um, an uncertain future in a different way and not uh, base decisions strictly on risk that comes from only a single set of assumptions uh, about the future. So while I'm not here to announce anything specific regarding timelines or processes for the post-2026 effort, I can tell you that it's very important to us that we design a process, both engagement and technical, that meets the expressed desires and addresses the challenges ahead, and that we do not intend to design a process, uh, neither engagement or technical, without outreach to key partners and stakeholders to ensure its workability. It's also important to us that we set up a sex successful process that does not predetermine any outcomes. So I, I can also tell you, and this may be a reminder for those of you who have been past reclamation processes or it is new, new to those of you who have not, this is not new in the way we've done business as you've heard from Terry on the Colorado River and how we've approached the design of previous processes. So forward by taking the concepts that have successfully guided past efforts, adapting them to reflect the current perspectives and realities in the basin. And if we continue to adhere to the foundational guiding principles of inclusivity, transparency, thoroughness, science base that have brought us this far, I believe will be set up as best we can be for a successful outcome. So in the short challenges we simply must address, I hope and expect that our short-term focus will also utilize these same core principles. It's our commitment and my personal commitment in this new role to continue to be guided by these core principles. That's why I was excited to compete for this position and honored to have been selected. In closing, thank you for all your work to address the current challenges the basin is facing, and I look forward to working with you all as we confront the future challenges through the development of the post-2026 operations. Thank you, and happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Terry, feel free to um, step back up to the podium. Another, um, speaking of intense collaborative efforts, Colorado River District is 15 minutes ahead. <laughs> so um, at 10.50, we're going to have Brad, you'd all start here and, and simulcast to them. So we have, which is good news is we have some nice time for Q&A and we thought we could bring Terry back up and um, feel free to direct your questions to Carly, Terry, or both. 9.50, sorry, 9.50, yes. 10 minutes. So what, what questions you all have? Or Terry, is there anything else you'd want to dive back into? I know uh, it was as. Well, uh, it's probably early. It's early for everyone, isn't it, relatively? Um, I would only at least uh, fill in the blank that I uh, didn't hear as I ended, and that is the finite period of time piece. I think, uh, I, I believe in it so strongly from a water management perspective that I, uh, it's just uh, part of the way we've done business. I would offer that up that I'd love to discuss that and have to be right now with others. I know um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about, um, I call it throw out the baby with the bathwater, starting over with the compact and do something that'll last a long time. and. I just firmly believe that given the uncertainty we have, we just have to figure out what we're gonna try to solve. There's a lot of things on the table. And, uh, and uh, as we go through trying to solve it, we'll figure out what the time frame is. Uh, Mexico is a great example. Um, if we hadn't put minute 319 in place, I don't think we would have gotten minute 323. We would have uh, treaded water and stumbled and fell for another few years and missed that golden opportunity. So uh, I think former Secretary Babbitt may have written something recently about a let's go 10 years, I'm, as I recall, or at least I think that's what he's been thinking. Um, and uh, those are uh, his opinions, too. And uh, and we've also heard that, hey, let's go one year. One year's enough, 
give us more time, but I don't like that. Uh, that means you're just going to continue to work and get nothing in my opinion. But, but um, anyway, uh, that's the only th uh, the last thing I would, would add. Yes. Um, I guess along that line for, for both of you, what are some of the factors you consider when trying to balance the flexibility with changing conditions and wanting to provide as much certainty as you can for water users and consumers? Yeah, that's a, um, a very good question, as, uh, and I mean that wholeheartedly. Um, well, there's a reason these things are called guidance. Uh, I mean, purposefully. Now, there's some really hard rules in that guidance that we uh, that won't violate without something changing. Um, but you don't want to be, it's this balance between uh, alcohol being specific enough and not too specific. Um, and so uh, with regard to what's coming, I don't know how that will play out, but with regard to what we've done in the past, uh, I think a, a good example is, is within the minutes. Uh, the minutes have uh, some very, very specific things, but it also, they have some very um, less defined things that allow us to have the flexibility to do things on the ground without having to go through a big process. Um, does that help answer that? It's, it's just, a, it's a trade-off. And you need lots of input to get to those trade-offs. Terry, I think that what, if I could just jump in, the, the one thing I would um, add to that question is I think it speaks to the importance of looking at a wide range of future outcomes when thinking about, um, you know, future operations and, um, you know, even though you may not specify uh, specific operations for every single possible outcome, you have at least gone through a process to explore um, those different outcomes, which I think can help um, lead to an understanding about certainty and, and flexibility. Hey, Terry, is that on? Terry and Carly, this is John Karen. Um, you know, the guidelines, the 07 guidelines had lots of, uh, as you've noted, um, good things and precedents in terms of collaboration, and, um, you know, uh, uh, setting the table for flexibility and operations. Um, I think it also had some degree of lessons learned in retrospect. And I'm wondering if uh, either of you would comment on things you'd absolutely would like to see different moving forward post 2026 in terms of how the system operates. Um, well, I'm going to let Carly have the first crack on this one because she's the post 2026 person. <laughs> Sorry, Carly. So the question was specifically, I, I was getting ready thinking, formulating in my head the answer because I thought you were going to say <laughs> different in terms of how the process was is run and then you landed on in terms of the actual results um so my formulated response um i you know we're uh i i think i said in in my remarks and it's very true at this point that nothing has been predetermined um we're coming in to this process uh, when we do initiate this process um, with a very open mind in, in terms of scope and in terms of what types of things will be considered um, as I think my minds were as well. And I think that that combined with a very robust stakeholder process um, will likely lead to some pretty innovative outcomes. Sorry, Carly, but I, I see you right here on this big screen and I felt like it was my opportunity. Real quick question for you. Um, you mentioned some really hard rules. Um, those are really the uh, flows at Lee Ferry. When do we address those questions? 
Um, you might have pointed at me on that one, Eric, but I, so I'm going to take the first crack. This is one of those uh, problems with data, basically, uh, originally, right, of estimates, because not directly measured, really. I mean, we can measure the flow, of course, but but to try to get back to that, what naturally would have been there is is difficult. So there's all of that sort of balled up in that. Um, but I think in terms of, and I will go out on a limb here a little, because it's my opinion, uh, in terms of that future, what are we going to do? I think that's one of the things we're going to have to deal with. Um, I think it's just going to be too difficult uh, to come up with a coordinated operation, which I think we have to do, these two big reservoirs, uh, with that, without dealing with that in some way. I don't know what that way is, Eric, but I think it's, it's got to be on the table. Hi, Carly. It's Ramsey, Krupp, and Terry. Thanks for your time today. Hi, Ramsey. I'm looking pretty good with my chin guard here. Um, <laughs> I had a question. You know, deadlines often drive uh, getting to a result, right? And I think of the guidelines as 2026. You know, they end in 2026, right? However, the hydrology is moving fast and not in a good way, as you well know far better than me. And there's political change that happens before 2026. And what what is your thinking about timing um, as 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 we move towards you know negotiating new guidelines? If that'll happen or should happen in a more in a faster, more responsive way? I could I could imagine trying to drop DCP two in between before 2026, but that seems like a lot of iterative effort too. So I'm interested in how you see that playing out. Okay, um, I'll take the first crack here, Carly. Um, I think there's a couple of three things that are relevant here. Um, one is you're exactly right. It's coming at us fast, faster than any of us, ex I think, expected years ago. Uh, there's some terms I heard the other day, need for speed uh, is a good one. Um, and so that's for sure. We need to, to be very efficient here on it. Um, the good news in terms of, of changes in administration, in my opinion, I've lived through, I lived through three eight-year administration changes, as I recall, but uh, several changes. The, and the good news is the Colorado River somehow stays what I call apolitical, right? It's just able to avoid that. And um, that's critical. We have to continue uh, to do that. Um, and I personally don't have any indication that would change, but, but I think that's um, uh, extremely important. And then the last thing we all know, I think most everyone in the room, we always build in these additional consultation provisions uh, probably not the best way to go, obviously, but it's our fail safe in some sense. And there's one in DCP. And uh, we always thought we hoped, we really hoped DCP would bridge the gap. If it doesn't, uh, there's, uh, we trigger additional consultations. And as water managers, I'm very optimistic. We must do something and we will always try to do the right thing. And I say that as we, the big basin we. And um, I'm optimistic we can, we can find a way to get us to that um, time frame. Um, we can, we've clearly showed we could do it faster. 07 guidelines. Um, not speaking for Carly here at all, I think, think she can chime in. I don't think we wanna try to do one of these uh, in a couple years. Um, it was pretty difficult, right, Carly? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was an it was pretty intense, uh, and I I was just the, just the modeler, and it was still pretty intense for that one. Um, I I would only add that, you know, we have a hard stop at 2026, obviously for for completing these new guidelines, and it's important um, to get them right and to run the right process and to not shortchange it and as so as you know we welcome the process being completed earlier uh it's also very important to take the time to do it right 
you know. And that includes, I know Carly would say, I know we're out of time. That includes the input, the involvement of everybody, right? We don't want to shortchange that um, just because of a deadline. But as Carly said, uh, if we can get there quicker, I'm sure um, we would choose to do that. Thank, thank you both so much. I know this conversation is going on much longer.